let's um, look at our first conversation now. Major issues impacting um, Nigeria now. We see inflation driven by rising energy costs, food inflation. Uh, but one thing seems to be a driver of both food and energy prices, insecurity. How does Nigeria crush um, this insecurity issue that's, you know, breeding oil theft and chasing farmers away from the farms? Joining me now for this conversation, uh, we have Mr. Adebayo Adeleke, the founder of Rootwatch. Joining me right here in the studio, great to have you. Good morning, laddie. It's been, a, it's been great to be back here. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> uh, it's been a while, you know, you've been on the show and a lot has happened. Absolutely. You know, since last time you came, we've seen food inflation. Mm -hmm. Even though, you know, it's tending downward, we're still seeing it, you know, elevated. Um, if you look at the data from um, last month, you see that uh, food inflation has actually has left that 40% level, which is good, but it's still elevated. Prices are still high, you know, at this point. Then we see energy prices. We're seeing the whole talk about... Um, oil theft, and, you know, looking at everything, you know, is the security situation improving in some kind of way in Nigeria? And if not, is, has Nigeria ever been this in, insecure where it's affecting food and energy? Uh, thanks for asking that question. It's quite a loaded question a yeah. bit. Uh, is Nigeria be this insecure? I, I would say with data, uh, I think yes over the course of time, because if you look at it, of course, we look back in time and say, Zach, you know what, we've never been this worse, but we've, ne we've never really looked into the data and all the factors affecting insecurity over the course of time. And oftentimes, what we're experiencing now is the inaction that has happened over the last 20 or 30 years. So if you look at it as Nigeria, we've never been this insecure. We have been always been insecure, but this much, probably not. You know, it's all about, it's, you have to put it in context. I mean, relative, but you've talked about, um, you know, food prices dropping. It's expected. You know, if you look at what's global, what's going on globally, it's not only Nigeria alone. Most of the countries are reporting uh, inflation drop. The United States has dropped uh, in the percentages as well. And we continue to see these things actually cascade into different countries, both developed and undeveloped countries. But one thing still remains. Insecurity is the bane of most of all, our, you know, food, trying to move for food insecurity to food security. But one of the things, all the metrics, all the different domains that we've collected data over the course of time, security, insecurity rather, has ranked top one or two factors actually affecting either from food inflation, food scarcity, you know, food, uh, agricultural production or whatnot. Insecurity has always been, and you and I will talk more, I think we're now pre-show pre conversation, I share some ideas with you, but I'd like to go into it and I'll share more um, right. insight. And, and, and definitely you, you have some um, data out that's um, root to watch and you did break down, you know, the risk level okay. in uh, some states. And, you know, from this, we see the likes of Bornu, Katsina, Kaduna, um, Niger, this too, they're high risk. Absolutely. Uh, from previous of 74 points to 83, that's what Bornu State mm -hmm. ranked 37 um, not much for the month-on-month -month change, but, you know, this, this is showing, you know, how risky most of these states. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to me about this, this date. So, uh, September, on September 11, we did something that hasn't been done before. We produced the Nigeria Security Index, which oftentimes, and I'll tell you a bit, if you, the time allows me to, see, to, to tell you why we actually arrive at this. Over the course of time, we have been kind of been on the receiving end of people kind of defining what Nigeria is from security point of view. But actually, you know, try not to be insensitive. Uh, we are bad, but we're not that bad, ideally. So we kind of look at what is the construct of security? How are we looking at security? And uh, in, what, in what lens, from what perspective have we been looking at security? Nigeria is not monolithic in any shape or form. You cannot subject the whole country of over 200 million to an action that only about less than 5% of the population is experiencing. And then you term the whole country as being infested with terrorism or different banditry or whatnot. So that's where we kind of look at it from the subnational level to be able to categorize what is really going on in Nigeria. We kind of look at that. Uh, magnifying lens and look at each state as, as we look at it. And Bono and Castina has been experiencing over the course of time. So what we did, we look at the last 10 years, you know, and to the month of June, by the way, that's how we did it. So that last, so we look at the last 10 years and we look at June 2023 to June 2024. 
what has really been going on. And we look at the ways of the nothing is really static. It's very, you know, moving and very wavy in any shape, some kind of weird shape like that. But one thing that's been consistent with Bono State that we've seen with the, you know, Boko Haram, with banditry and whatnot is going on over there. So it's quite a reflective. You know, data is reality, and this one is one of them. And we begin to see what's going on in Kaduna as well, as we've seen historically. I mean, what has been reported in the news, both primary and secondary data shows the same as such. And then Niger. Now, very interesting, Niger is the biggest state in Nigeria, and also is the farmland as well. So this thing is actually quite important as we continue to look at you know, how do we move from food insecurity to food security? We have to look at, you know, the greens belt, the tuba belt of Nigeria, because if you look at Nigerian food system, it's based, it's tuba and grain based. So how is food, how is insecurity affecting the grain belt? How is food security affecting the tuba belt? And then you begin to see, you know, the, the data will start speaking to you. But I remember I mean. when, uh, you know, yam, just, you know, tuba of yam, no, at some point, <laughs> so about not really thousand naira. About seven thousand naira for one tube. Absolutely. And you know, when I was when one of these uh, sellers told me that price, I I just said, you know what, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I'm not going to buy it. You know, at this point, it's really expensive. Just one tube. How how much? How many of you know the family is that going to feed? Yeah, and, and, and we're seeing all of that. Price. And one of our research, actually, funny enough, and I'll show you the story. One of our research, you know, in Yoruba traditional uh, marriage right is to provide forty two tubers of yam. To the to the bride's That's family. a fortune. It's a fortune. I actually became contentious in one family. Like, why will I provide you for the two tubers of yam when each of them is about seven thousand naira? You know what kind of? Food? It was it was very interesting when you look at those reports as we continued as we went to the field to gather those uh, those data. So it become contentious. Not only that, and at that particular that singular event actually not only tells us about how significant this food inflation price is. It actually you know went as far as affecting some of our cultural uh, cultural norms as well. Right, so, yeah. you know, those trying to get married traditionally, definitely the costs exactly. of traditional marriage, exactly. you know, also rising because of the Exactly. But you, you also looked at it from a national um, level that you took in the whole of Nigeria, not yes. just, you know, the sub-national level. And you did come up with this um, uh, score. I think the score was about uh, in the 20s, you know, region, if you can put that up for me. Uh, but these are other states, you know, yes. but on a national level, if you look at the national um, data, we see that there's been some kind of, you know, it looks good, you know, when you look at it, you know. Yeah, so, so, yeah, if you look at it. Yeah, the national level. Yeah. Exactly. So if you look at the national level, we're, we're moderate risk. Moderate. If, exactly, moderate risk. Because you cannot tell me that people in Bono, they're experiencing the same reaction when it comes to the issue of insecurity to the people of Lagos. If what is going on in Bono happens in Lagos, it's a completely different uh uh, it will be a completely different scenario as we view Nigeria. So Nigeria in its own entirety, different state governors are tackling uh, uh, you know, insecurity differently. Jigawa, for example, they've been doing some marvelous work over there, how they've been able to actually employ the youths and employ the population and getting them into agriculture has actually lower uh, their, you know, their, their security risk. factor, exactly, security risk factor. And some other states as well, Cross River has been the lowest of all states as we continue to move the south Southwestern state, you know, with the with the institution of uh, Amotekun as well, but also there are some other programs as well that they are using. We call it the non-kinetic programs that they are using. You know, as I as I explained to you over the course of time, is that when we talk about security in Nigeria, ourselves Nigerians and the world at large have been programmed to define security from uh, just uh, law enforcement and military perspective. But security is quite deeper than that because there are several expressions of security. If you look at it for national security, border security, economic security, energy security. There's so many expressions of security. But you really want to get to the bane of this whole thing, you have to look at it like, for Nigeria to really solve this problem of insecurity, the military and the law enforcement is the last, is the last stop. That all the MDAs in Nigeria, each and every one of them has what we call the line of effort, the non-kinetic line of effort that directly affects security. As I explained to you, the uh, what is going on in Jigawa? Jigawa used something different to be able to tackle their own security, and they saw the result. Imagine all the MDAs now contributing in different, you know, affecting the economy, agricultural production, is it data production and everything? We begin to see the shift 
in how we term what we see and the activities we see from the security perspective. And the last one, if there's still after every MDA has contributed from their own non-kinetic uh, line of effort, anyone that is still hanging out there will call them radicals and let the military and the law enforcement go out there and wipe them out. That is how you affect security and how you improve security, either at the community level, either at the state and regional level and national level as well. Right, and you know, definitely, you, you did mention you know the non-kinetic yes. uh, measures at this time. But uh, talk to me about technology now. How much, how much technology is really playing into our security? You know, at this point, and you know, we've been talking about funding. Yes, funding. Yes, you know, defense funding. Mm -hmm. We've heard some quarters say it's not enough. Some say we're spending a lot. You know, when it comes to defense. So let me marry that, you know, technology and spending. So I'm glad you asked it. Uh, Root, uh, Root Watch, we've been working intensely uh, on the Root Watch intelligence side. And also in the upcoming weeks, we're going to be releasing the Food Security Index, the force from Nigeria, about how we view food, uh, food security. And what I can tell you, categorically speaking, I haven't been on the field for the last four months. Uh, about both on the food security side and physical and community security side. Technology plays a huge role. Actually, I believe it's the bridge, uh, 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 the bridge above trouble waters for us in Nigeria. For, able, for us to be able to tackle uh, security, all form of security, we need technology. And the basic form of it that we are lacking at this particular point in time is data. You know, we cannot... You don't, you know, you can't solve what you don't know. And that's it. it. The moment you're solving what you don't know, you're actually being disingenuous to yourself and to the people you actually govern. And I don't think we actually have really sat down and looked at security architecture, both from the national level to the local government level and all the all kind of levels in between. How are we using data? What do we know about security within our confines, within our government, within our communities, within our borders? There's so many good data. I can be shooting all kinds of data to you right now. You'll be shocked. But we need data more than anything else. And the architecture that produces data is lacking. And I, trust me, I collect data on food and security on a day-to-day -day basis every single day. It's not cheap. Uh, trust me, like the Americans, you say, ain't cheap. You know, and, uh, and we have to invest more on it. If you really want to solve this problem, uh, oftentimes when you look at some of these issues, you would think, is it a feature or is it a bug? Because oftentimes you will always attack this thing as a bug, but when you look deeper, you're like, this, this is looking like a feature. You know, it's like this thing is rather done deliberately. So because the more data you have, the more people are informed. And the more people are informed, the more they're going to challenge what is, being, what, is, what is the status quo. And the more people challenge the status quo, they see the light. The more they see the light, you know, the more people you know, want more for themselves and more for their generation. Right. And that's where we are right now. That's the crossroad we find ourselves. And definitely, you know, it, it seems uh, most of the economic headwinds we're having, you know, right now, we're not able to sell as much oil you know, mm -hmm. as we should, because you know, we've heard the story about um, oil theft. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're making wins, yes. you know, with that at this point, because we're trying to ramp up production so we can, you know, getting more revenue and have some more oil to refine, you know, domestically. So a, a lot to unpack there, but we'll take a break now. Okay. When we come back, we're going to break um, all of that down. Still watching uh, Business Morning on Sunrise Daily. Thank you. Welcome back. Well, we're still looking at um, solving the security, insecurity uh, problem so we can have food security and energy as security. I still have with me Adebayo here, uh, helping me break down, you know, most of this data. So, you know, definitely it's one thing, you know, having data, mm -hmm. and it's another thing, using it. How can policymakers, you know, make use of all this data and this, you know, technology you have right here? Absolutely. So what data does is to give you the insight. Uh, the more you dig into it, the more you kind of probe the problems. You know, like I said earlier, uh, one of the prob one of the, you know, stages of you know, solving problem is, you know, what is the problem and, you know, how do I get here? And data gives you the insight of it. And what we've discovered, especially we're using this data to be able to shine light, you know, on this, you know, if we kind of break down uh, some of these uh, attributes that we use in calculating these indexes, we're now beginning to see what is actually causing this uprising. You know, like we did during the 10, 10 days of protest, we found out, I mean, some of the, in, some of the data uh, deep diving, 
you know, activities we did on data, we found out that a lot of it actually is based on food insecurity, you know, because people are hungry, you know, that's why a lot of people are quite easily enticed to go on the street and whatnot. And that... And we see how that impacts um, our elections. Exactly, exactly. So you see how these things are so interwoven. So because of food insecurity, affect fiscal security. Because of that fiscal insecurity, affect economic security. Because that affect political security. See how all those human security expressions are all interwoven. That if you solve one, that there's high probability that the other one will subside. Which one should we attack first? Which food one is life. Solve? Food is life because if you don't have food, you can't live. So anything else emanates from it. So if you can actually solve the issue of food security, for example, now one of the one of things you're going to see in upcoming weeks when we publish the food security index is that in the North States of Nigeria, there is no food storage that is owned by the state or the local government. So tell me, if anything happens to a particular state, how can that particular state survive or feed its citizen, or a citizen, rather, depending on how you're looking at it? You know, th those are the questions the governors, the leadership of these opportunity states are so, supposed so to start looking at. How am I going to feed my population? You know, how do, I mean, if you cannot feed your population, then how do you energize economic activity in such state? What will now entice investors to come to your state if you cannot even feed your own state? If your state is that prone to all kind of, you know, insecurity? So these are the questions that data actually tells you. I mean, these are the answers that data actually, you know, gives you in the process of kind of finding uh, answers to some kind of problem. So, like, you know, back to your question, using data to probe the problem. And that problem is now given insight. What we are trying to do with Route Watch is to present, using data to present the problem. And let people behind us, coming behind us, like, these are the problems. These are what causes these problems. You have the ability to solve these problems. These are the tools. These are the areas that you need to solve. You have the, you know, the financial buoyancy and whatnot to solve this problem. Let somebody else come behind us, you know. Once we've kind of express the problem and explain what the problem is to them. Let people that have the insight that can solve the problem come behind those, such as the government, the policymakers, because these data should help the policymakers as well to be able to enact policies that favors different aspects of the problems being, you know, being discussed. Right. So that is why we can use technology. But again, to collect data, you need technology to collect data. You know, different, like for example- I'm guessing collecting data is not cheap. It's very, very expensive. If I begin to tell you, big as Nigeria. if I begin to tell you to collect data, daily data on food prices in Nigeria, in both formal and informal markets, categorically, I mean, without being conservative, rather, it's going to cost about 200 million every month, 200 million naira every month to collect data on all 36 states and the federal capital territory on both formal markets and informal markets and just getting the food prices because you need those numbers to be able to understand how the prices are moving, the inflection in prices, what is causing prices. Because funny enough, when anything happens in Nigeria, either the dollar drops or rises or something happens, the fuel subsidies or whatever, the informal market, the prices of food is the first thing that, that gets that that gets that notification and people will feel it immediately. Actually it doesn't even it doesn't even last hours. I still like seeing these people have a WhatsApp group whereby they discuss this. I think they must have a group. I'm telling you because... But it's funny how that group does not reflect when prices should actually go down. Exactly. The prices don't go down as exactly. fast as they rise. So, exactly. But all of that information. So it, it, it's, it's very critical that we understand how these things are all networked, are all interwoven, because it, it gives us clarity of thought. So it, it is important. For example, I mean, I, I just share with you, 200 million Naira to collect food data on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis. You really want to have data on how to solve some of these So imagine a serious government will now look at it. It's like, how can I begin to help? How can I begin to use data to be able to solve some of these problems? These are kind of programmatic spending I have to do, some kind of allocation to be able to do that. And we have, we are really sincere about our efforts to actually solve this problem. I think it can be done. It can be done. It can Definitely. be done. We yes. put aside a good chunk of money to actually Absolutely. collect you know, all of that data so that you can have something to, you know, actually work it. So, you know, you know, going forward now, mm -hmm. what are you seeing for 2025? You know, when you've looked at all of this data, are you seeing improvement, you know, on the radar or you know, looking at the body language, you know, of this um, government and also the, you know, non-kinetic, are you seeing security situation improving? 
Yes, in some areas. Uh, so if you look at what the military has been doing in the last six months, they really wrap up on the kinetic efforts. And that, <clears throat> excuse me, and that has taken out a lot of radicals. So I begin to, I, I foresee that, but that particular traction continue to go well, and that will kind of drill it down, but that's just a bandage. Uh, over the last, you know, uh, you know, if you assess the, the current administration, over the last 12 months, they've done significant dent from the kinetic point of view of, you know, kind of interdicting a lot of this stuff, you know, getting to the heart of some of these radical uh, communities and kind of disrupting them. They've been able to do that. The effect of that is yet to be seen in large scale of how do they gather, do they regroup and all those kind of stuff. So that is, we'll continue to monitor that. For the last 12 months, we'll continue to monitor. And I foresee this going forward, they'll continue that trajectory because the military is really on their heels on that. But now the rest of the MDAs, I really do not, if they don't actually, you know, get the act together, because some of the solutions I see them proposing over the course of time, then it doesn't make sense to me. And I'm just being frank with you, it doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't show that they genuinely understand the root cause of some of these problems. And if we don't understand the problem, how can you solve a problem you don't understand? That's a question that I'm not trying to be complex in any shape or form. I'm just having a simple question. How can you solve a problem you don't understand? So if the MDAs are not using their non-kinetic you know, line of effort from their own you know, different ministries and agencies to solve security problems, the military will always be at the you know, brunt end of it. People always begin to blame, they will continue to blame the military. Right. Because so until... Uh, until I see different, uh, until I see a lot of actions from these MDAs, like genuine actions towards security measures, uh, okay. I think the status quo will remain the same. All right, so so much to unpack, um, definitely, and we'll still keep um, watching and checking out all of this data. I'm um, coming out of uh, Roots Watch. Thank you so much, Adebayo. I'm um, a the founder of uh, Roots Watch. Thank you so much. Thank for you so much helping Lally. us unpack all of this data. Thank you.